G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and I'm sorry we're uh, a few seconds late this morning, we've had some technical difficulties. Um, welcome to our fortnightly poll position webinar, where we give you the scoop on the latest results of the Guardian Essential Poll every fortnight. Today, um, you might see from my different background, I'm on Nguyen country, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Days and times for the Australia Institute's webinars do vary, so please head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find the details for upcoming webinars. And a couple of quick Zoom housekeeping tips. You can type questions for our panelists in using the Q&A box. You should also be able to upvote other people's questions and make comments on them as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And finally, a reminder, this is a live event and it is being recorded. And the video will be available later today at australiainstitute.tv. The audio will also go up as a podcast episode of Guardian's Australian Politics podcast um, sometime tomorrow morning. I would like to welcome our regular panellist, Catherine Murphy, political editor of Guardian Australia, Pete Lewis, executive director of Essential Media, and Richard Dennis, chief economist at the Australia Institute, is joining us this week as well, because we're going to be getting stuck into the budget, amongst other things. Uh, and they do say that a week is a long time in politics, and the last fortnight has been packed in Australian politics. We saw the Treasurer deliver the federal budget, Ukrainian President Vladimir, Vladimir Zelensky addressed the Australian Parliament. And of course, the Prime Minister is expected to call the election any day now. Communities across New South Wales and Queensland are still recovering from the floods. And just in the last 24 hours, the IPCC has delivered yet another scathing report about the world's lack of action to reduce emissions. I think last time we spoke, South Australia had just elected a new Labor Premier, and just yesterday the Premier of Tasmania announced he was retiring, meaning there'll be a new Liberal Premier and a new member elected on count back down there. But really, the last fortnight has been dominated quite a bit by the internal politics of the Liberal Party in particular. Uh, so we might get stuck into why that is the case. But Catherine, um, we will get stuck into the budget in a second, but I did just want to focus on the non-budget politics for a second. The election any day now, two weeks ago, we were kind of talking about bullying allegations from um, Senator Kimberly Kitching um, after her um, death, her very sad death. But um, in the last week, we've seen quite a speech from Senator Fervanti Wells from the Liberal Party that's really shifted the debate onto the character of the Prime Minister. Um, why is this speech causing the Prime Minister trouble? <laughs> well, it, it's sort of uh, the, the, the sort of short version of the trouble for Morrison with this intervention and some interventions that have followed it is that it sort of plays to a pre-existing set of propositions. If we look back at the Guardian Essential poll over the last 12 months, that's the 12 months just gone, uh, Scott Morrison's approval uh, in the mind of voters dropped by 19 points over the course of the year. Uh, and that's sort of you know, a function of you stay around in politics, uh, you get a record and people start to, uh, I guess their, their impressions of you start to become more solid. And uh, so the, the sort of damage, I guess, for the Prime Minister of Connie Fiavanti Wells' intervention is that some of the sort of ne negative character traits that she uh, alleged against him uh, sort of play back into this sense in the community that the Prime Minister is off the boil uh, and uh, may not necessarily be governing in their best interests. I missed the, the, last, the last poll position because I was out on the ground in Tasmania in the two marginal seats in the northwest of the state. And you do have difficulty at the moment finding voters that you speak to in the streets, in the towns, in northwest Tasmania. If it is difficult to find someone with a good word to say about the Prime Minister. Uh, so I think that's the difficulty for the government. Um, is that it plays into these, I suppose, negative um, or, or preset negative perceptions of the Prime Minister. Obviously, if you love the Prime Minister, it'll make not a lot of difference. It'll just make you feel sorry for him and think there's a pile on. But 
for voters who are sort of looking at the Prime Minister and thinking, yeah, I'm not really sure about you, mate. Uh, this is not uh, this is not helpful. And also just from a basic campaign strategy point of view, uh, as Ed points out, the election is imminent. Uh, hours, days, who knows, uh, but close, close enough to uh, feel and, and touch. Uh, at the moment, the Liberal campaign will have to be wargaming the sort of this phenomenon that we've seen uh, over the last couple of weeks of blue on blue attacks. This isn't you know, we've, we've not yet seen Labor's negative advertising campaign against the Prime Minister that will doubtless be unleashed during, at some point during the campaign. Uh, this, is, this is criticism and, and critique of the Prime Minister emanating from within his own side. Now, obviously, you know, you can, you can discount it. You can say uh, Connie Fiavanti Wells and some others have never been a fan of Scott Morrison's and that is absolutely true. But the difficulty is that it does create this negative feedback loop, which can sort of feed on itself. And then logistically, if you're sitting in the back room of the Liberal campaign right at the moment, you'd be thinking to yourself, oh, my God, uh, you know, how does this end? Will it end? And how do we try and inoculate our candidates in marginal seats against sort of being caught in this negative backwash against the Prime Minister? So it's quite an interesting phenomenon just on the eve of the campaign. It surely is. And uh, we are about to head into the campaign. Uh, but Richard, uh, Chief Economist at the Australia Institute, I did want to touch on the budget um, just a little bit. Um, Catherine, you, you were quite scathing in your analysis, which people can find on Guardian Australia, and we might come back to that. But Richard, what was your um, sense of the budget and how it's landed? Oh, budget. That was a week ago, Ebony. A, a, a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, budgets reveal uh, a government's priorities. And, and this budget revealed this government has no priorities. Um, really, like, what, what problem are they trying to solve? What problem were their announcements and their policies focused on fixing? Uh, one and only thing, getting themselves re-elected. You know, if, if, and it's a giant if, managing the economy was their number one goal, which part of the economy? Are they really trying to drive productivity growth? Because they didn't announce anything that really will. Uh, are they really trying to reshape our labour market? Because if they are, they didn't announce anything that will. They're clearly not worried about debt or deficits anymore. They're clearly not worried about household debt or national debt or the current account deficit. Like, what problem are they actually trying to solve? And, of course, the only problem is that Labor might win, right? <laughs> so, so they literally don't, and needless to say, they're not interested in tackling climate change or reducing income inequality or fixing Indigenous disadvantage. Like these things don't even occur to them uh, to discuss. But even if you want to take their language of managing the economy seriously, which bit of the economy are they trying to manage? Which economic problem is in their sights that they are saying, come on, everyone, we need to get on and do this. It's just, here, have, have some money. Try and forget that we haven't fixed wages growth. Try and forget the fact that you're spending a fortune on private health insurance. Try and forget the fact you can't afford household insurance. Like, it's just, here's a little bit of money in the lead up to the budget to show we're listening. But that's actually not the job of government. Like, listening's nice, right? But you're actually supposed to have some plan for yourself and for your government. And, and Scott Morrison's plan is to say Anthony Albanese would be worse. Now, the voters will decide that, but yeah, there was literally nothing in the budget to, to kind of solve any economic problem. There was literally just raw politics. And interestingly, I think at this point in world history, where people are looking to government for health, they are looking for government for climate change, they are looking for health uh, to government to, to deal with uh, things like uh, gender pay gaps. A whole bunch of people are looking to the government to say, well, what are you going to do about this problem? And Scott's like, can I give you 250 bucks? I don't think it's working. Yeah, and on that note, Pete, um, I know you've got some budget questions in the slides uh, for today's essential poll. Um, so if you want to take us now, I know we're going to start off with that political problem and um, where things are at uh, in poll positions. Essential, 
essential poll uh, results for this week. Um, so kick us off with the first slide, if you yeah, don't. Mind. I will. And, and as everybody knows, um, we are not interested in horse race polling until it's election time. And then it becomes very exciting and interesting, doesn't it, folks? If you're listening to this as a podcast, you can also go to essentialreport.com.au and play at home. So the first slide we've got up is federal voting intention summary. On one level, this looks really evenly balanced. Um, 36 primary for Labor, 37 primary for Coalition, 10 for the Greens on one yeah, on, on one flank, 12 for other independents on the other flank and undecideds down to 5%, which is pretty low. We've been as high as 12 in our polls. So we are starting to get to people. And remember the, the undecideds, which we made a conscious decision to keep in the poll, they are people that refuse to give an opinion on two attempts. We ask them once and we say, who are you going to vote for? And then if they can't give us an answer, we say, well, who might you vote for? And then if they can't say an answer to that, then we say, well, you're someone that hasn't made up their mind yet. That's down to one in 20, which is still enough to, to change the election, right? Um, that would work out in the old form of a 2PP of 50 to 45. So we're not saying anyone's in front because of those 5%. But I think that 12%, which is the other independent, is also really, really interesting because while it, it feels that a lot of these, that, that includes UAP, one Nation, but also Teal Independence, which are in some of the metro areas now polling into the 20s. Um, and I think in a way, there's a bit of a sense that this is the Liberals' green moment, that they're really now facing an organised, loose coalition of candidates who are pooling resources to, to put pressure on them from their left flank. Um, I'll just go through these lines in a little bit more granularity. This, this sort of shows us the journey since um, midway through last year. It's bounced around a bit. As you saw, those dots, the dot bit without a line is the um, don't knows. And as low as it's been. And then in terms of the 2PP with don't knows, <clears throat> does that mean Labor's going to win the election? No. Um, I think we've said that it's got to be one seat by seat, but it's also got to be one on a national wave. History shows us that governments change in a wave election, not in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but particularly given the not so friendly fire that the prime minister is receiving at the moment and the fact that he appears to be now the real issue this election is about, um, Labor's in a good position to start the campaign, which could be a matter of hours. I might and jump up so that we can... Time. Just for those playing at home, that number was Labor on 50% with the coalition on 45% and 5% don't know or oh, undecided. Sorry, I was being non-verbal. That's um, all right. Um, Catherine, obviously, uh, you've talked a little bit already about some of those negatives, but as Richard was talking about, some of the budget was aimed at trying to plug some of those holes in the dam, so to speak. Um, but it's certainly still not looking great for the coalition. Well, look, the, the, there's a sort of mythology that we um, all engage in year, year in, year out about budgets that, that there's sort of that there's a bounce to be had, that there's a political bounce to be had over budgets. If you look at data over the long cycle, it's very rare, actually, for a budget to deliver a measurable bounce for an incumbent government. It's just not really how it works. But in terms of how the government wanted to start off this campaign, they were certainly hopeful that the budget would do a couple of things for them. One sort of turn the conversation back into issues of economic management and security, which the Liberal and Nationals have an historical advantage over their opponents in, in terms of, if we look at the data, although interestingly not at the moment, which is something that we could possibly get to. But look, historically, it's certainly true. If the conversation is about security and economic management, uh, Labor is not advantaged by that conversation. So I think what the government wanted the budget to do was give people a fistful of dollars, which is absolutely what happened, uh, pay off Barnaby Joyce for his support for net zero with an absolutely stonkingly huge infrastructure package, most of it out on the never never, but nonetheless, there it is. And also turn the conversation back to those main issues where, where the coalition historically has an advantage over their opponents. And then, so if we measure that then, Ed, what happened next? Okay, the budget's delivered. Um, 
sort of momentarily after the budget was delivered, there was a memorial service for Shane Warne, which, boom, blanketed out uh, sort of much discussion about the key initiatives. Also, Con uh, Conchetta Fair Vanity Wells chose budget night to get up in the adjournment in the Senate and lob her Katusha missile. Uh, so I think basically th that sort of first, you know, the days after the budget uh, where, where the government would have hoped that there would have been a lot of attention on the measures and a lot of discussion around their preferred frame was basically a complete wipe wipeout. So I think what the Prime Minister is trying to do this week in the days or hours that remain before the election's called is to try and sort of revisit that patch. Like uh, just before we came together for the show today, guys, the Prime Minister was standing up literally in front of a petrol bowser in Sydney. And Maurice Payne was taking questions about, you know, the latest developments in the Ukraine in front of a petrol bowser, um, which is sort of like not a, not a sight you see very often. So anyway, look, the government's trying to get the focus back on the budget look we gave you money look the fuel price is lower uh, and you trust us more than the others to you know do all this hard stuff that's what he's trying to do in in the days or hours that remain ahead of the election um but you know so far there's been more distraction i guess than than um clear air for the prime minister to engineer that pivot that he's trying to do at the moment yeah, thank you. Pete, do you want to take us back into the slides again and we'll um, start get into some of those um, budget slides? Indeed. Um, again, the graceful pivot. So <laughs> this first slide, you might need to go in a little bit tight, listeners, but it's looking at this question we ask after every budget. In general, do you think the federal budget will be good or bad for the following groups? And the one I want you to look at is the red line because that's the retail line. That's you personally. 24% um, of people in what is a cash flash budget are actually saying it's going to be good for me personally. That is not a great result um, from where I sit. Um, the biggest um, beneficiaries, 44%, the green line, people who are well off, um, there's another a bunch of other formulations, but there is, in terms of it being a circuit breaker, breaker I don't think it's broken any circuits here. Um, second question, most important economic issue. I think the coalition were ready to run an election on um, unemployment. I think they've been test driving an iteration of an old famous British campaign, which would have been our plan is working. Um, the Tories won in England back in the 80s, I think it was, with Britain's not working. And it would be neat. And, it, you know, there are certain formulations that have been tested by the other side. And I can say that it doesn't quite work at the moment because I think the biggest problem with unemployment is that if unemployment's low, there's fewer people that are worried about that particular economic indicator. Cost of living is the only story, as you can see here. 61% say cost of living is the most important economic issue followed by housing prices, that's people that are renting, um, government debts under 10%, wage growth, while it's getting a lot of, um, you know, focus, only 8% put it ahead of cost of living. I think those two are probably inextricably linked. Um, and then unemployment down at 6%, um, and interest rate um, is almost as low as the interest rates at the moment, which is about 2%. <laughs> um, I'll run through a couple of others just to sort of give you the picture because we probed the budget for a few angles. This is interesting. Party trust to help manage household expenses, which is really what a cost of living election is about. Labor's ahead 37.26, with 37 saying make no difference. That number almost reflects the slide we had on national security a few weeks ago as well in terms of managing the relationship with China. So both where we all think the coalition has a natural advantage, economic management and national security, the actual indicators of both those, Labor is actually ahead, although not a majority and a lot still to be convinced. I hope I'm building a bit of a picture here. I thought this was also interesting. Federal budget impact on voting intention. Um, total all Australians, 25% are more likely to vote the coalition, 19% um, less. It, it wasn't as if the budget stiffed. People, if, if you say, do you want free money? People will say, yes, thank you. Um, it just means what comes after that is not necessarily their vote. Um, the big problem was most of those that thought they were more likely to vote for the coalition were going to vote for them anyway. So that's probably an, um, protect your base rather than build 
built. Only 8% of people that weren't already um, considering the coalition are now more likely to look at them. And that's not nothing, but it's not, um, it's also, well, that's actually 8% of coalition voters less likely to vote for them. So that's probably an unintended consequence. Finally, views towards objective of federal government. 56% think it's just about the election. They agree with Richard. 44% helping the economy build and get stronger. We asked that after each budget. The interesting thing there is after the last budget, it was 55, 45 the other way. We're normally cynical, but not this cynical. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you, Pete. Um, Catherine, I want to come back to you just on, I guess, um, yeah, the overall picture of the budget. And of course, we've had Anthony Albanese's uh, budget reply as well in the interim. You've talked about the fact there kind of isn't any bounce there, but the cost of living issues are real ones. Um, how much is that going to hurt that people are genuinely feeling these pressures but aren't necessarily feeling that relief from the budget? Yeah, well, it sort of depends how what mindset people are in, Eb, I think. Uh, there's no conflict between the major parties on the budget measures for cost of living relief. Uh, Labor was not inclined to uh, pick a fight this close to the election about any of those measures in the budget. So the, the cut to fuel excise and also the cash payments, all of that was sort of waved through in the blink of an eye. Uh, so there's sort of no stickiness there around sort of the respective approaches to ameliorating cost of living pressure. But obviously, if we step back a, a, a bit, there are quite, diff quite different approaches in the platforms of the respective parties about what approach you take in the event either one wins the election to get a more durable solution to these issues. So, uh, but, you know, again, it's sort of incumbent on Labor, though, to uh, sort of move from the, the point of no disagreement in the budget to the point of disagreement on, on the policy solutions more broadly, right? Because the interesting thing about voters at the moment, or certainly voters that we've spoken to uh, in the run up to the campaign for a, a marginal seats period, uh, series, which we will start to roll out reasonably soon, is, uh, you know, as I said, there's, there's a lot of negative feedback about the Prime Minister at the moment. You lit People literally line up to give you that. Uh, where we've been, though, the, the Labor alternative is not, it has not cut through yet to voters. Voters aren't really sure what Labor's about. It's not like it was in 2019. When we were out in the field in 2019, there was a, a lot of really uh, foregrounded hostility about Bill Shorten as a candidate. People were quite negative about him and, and a bit like Morrison now, they'd cross the road to tell you about it. <laughs> um, now the situation's reversed. They're certainly not negative about the opposition leader. I can't recall anybody who, who, who said anything particularly negative about him, but they, they, they really don't know what the Labor offer is. And in order to change the government, I think there, there does have to be a call to action that, that voters recognise. It's not just a matter of people being so angry with Morrison that it's all done, although that happens. Anyway, it's a bit of a long-winded yeah. answer to the question. But or the, the short version is that there's a campaign to be won, I think, by either side. There is some scope for Morrison to turn back some of the negative sentiment. There's also scope for Labor to really, um, you know, dig in and and sort of draw, I guess, sort of paint the picture of how all of these negative perceptions of Morrison fit together in in a picture that's not pretty for the country for the next three years. So anyway, yeah. we'll, we'll 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 we shall see, as they say in the classics, we shall <laughs> see. Um, Pete, just coming back to you, you had kind of a funny take on that. I thought today in your Guardian uh, op-ed. I've held another metaphor hostage today, um, Ebony, but um, I do see this as being a clash of different styles. And I see Morrison as being like a sumo wrestler who's just trying to use the heft of incumbency to squash the opponent with, you know, boondoggles and cheesy photo ops and lots and lots of money. Whereas I have to do a bit of research on this about the difference, but he, Albo's more doing judo where he's trying to use the opponent's power against him to trip him up. And I think he's done this quite effectively over the last year to the point now where I think Albo has got Morrison in a spot 
where Morrison is Morrison's biggest weakness. And the problem Morrison now faces is that every day of the campaign, the biggest weakness of Morrison is going to be delivering the grabs to the media. And Morrison can't do a Dave Sharma and say, I'm not with Morrison because Morrison is Morrison. So <laughs> if this gets pulled off like this, it is actually, you know, in the finest traditions of um, judo, of not engaging head on, but taking your opponent's heft, even to the extent the budget was about aged care. Aged care is actually about saying, that's not new labor policy, that's moral. into thinking that Bill Shorten would poison their children. But three years later, like the boots on the other foot and he can't hide from it. He can't run a campaign that he's not the front of. And that is his biggest risk of holding on to power. I could just say yeah. something real quick, Ev, just on that point. It is it is interesting uh, for for folks on with us on the show today to think about that this is the first election campaign in, in a very long while where the incumbent prime minister will have a record. <laughs> it's the long, it's in a very long while because basically because of the revolving door of prime ministers over the last 10 years, the, the, the contests, you know, where, where the incumbent has a record have been the exceptions rather than the rules. So it is really interesting to think about, um, you know, how that, how that impacts the contest anyway just simple point just wanted to put that in people's minds yeah uh Richard I wanted to come back to you Catherine mentioned earlier um some boondoggles for Barnaby Joyce in the budget um and I know you've been looking a, a little bit into that um and I guess I guess this is in the context of um you know all of those cost of living pressures that people are feeling the cash splashes that were also there um as you know one-off handouts for people but can you just talk to me a little bit about what was in the budget for Barnaby uh, Joyce as kind of payback for passing net zero by 2050. Uh, uh, sure, I will. But if you don't mind, I'll do it in the context of Pete's metaphor and leaving aside that I, I don't like picturing Scott Morrison in one of those sumo underpants. Mushashi. Out. It's the first time I've got <laughs> just, to use political mushashi. Can I, can I just say, can I just say, Richard, without disrupting your flow, Pete needs no encouragement with the metaphors. But anyway, <laughs> back to you. Well, but I, I think that the thing that Scott Morrison fears most is being held accountable. Uh, I, I, if you look through his career pre-politics and in politics, he's always been promoted out of trouble. You know, whenever there's been an unfinished problem or a crisis, he's actually just been promoted out. Uh, but of course, when you're the prime minister, there's there's, there's nowhere but down. So I think what uh, what what Anthony Albanese has done very well is keep saying, "Sorry, Scott, that's on you." What he, you know, how how did that go? And I, again, I think the budget really kind of draws out how how kind of raw the politics of, of Anthony, uh, uh, sorry, of Scott Morrison's approach is and, and how vulnerable he is to Anthony Albanese because the one thing we know the Prime Minister thinks he's good at is the announceable and the budget papers are just full of announceables and soon to be announceables, uh, but that's, that's the trap, right? Because no one actually believes he'll finish anything. No one thinks that anything he announces will be delivered or have the benefits that it's supposed to be. And yes, he'll be very creative. Oh, look, that's a hat I haven't seen him wear before. Oh, look, he's next to a petrol bowser. I mean, the, the, the TV news will love it. But really now, I think the fact that 61% of people are thinking about cost of living, the fact that most people think that he's in it for himself means that the one thing he knows how to do is announce something new to distract you from what he didn't do, you know, that's now his weakness. So the dams, I, I think, are, are that writ large. Barnaby Joyce is out there saying, look, I got $5 billion for this dam that for 80 years, treasurers have said no to. For 80 years, 
finance ministers have said no to. Josh Frydenberg's the first treasurer in Australian history to think the Hell's Gate to him is a good idea. Now, of course, he doesn't think it's a good idea. He just knows he can't win a fight with Barnaby. So when Barnaby's out there standing in front of the big dam and Morrison's out there saying, look at all the money we're pouring literally down this drain, I think people are beginning to see uh, this, is, this is your only trick. And again, at a time where people are worried about COVID, they are worried about hospitals, they are worried about climate change, they are worried about defence, I think they know they need more than that. Uh, and, and it's true that, you know, Labor hasn't laid out a big positive agenda, but I think Labor have said, we take this stuff more seriously than that. Uh, and, and for Morrison, just being asked again and again, why didn't you finish the last thing you started? Why didn't you achieve the last thing you promised? How's this thing really going to help? Uh, I think that's, that's, that's in a lot of people's heads. And, you know, it'll be a, it'll be a bitter and acrimonious election campaign. They always are. But Scott Morrison's look at my new thing, ignore my track record. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. And, and Catherine makes an important point. He's the first prime minister with a three year track record to take to an election. And that's the last thing he really wants us to focus on. Yeah, look, I'm just going to apologise because the next door neighbours just started his tractor to mow the lawns before it starts raining again here. So if it's loud, I'm going to try and keep myself um, on mute as much as possible. Uh, and apologies if you can hear the dogs and the tractor in the background. Um, I'll go to the Q&A from the audience now. Uh, the first question I've got is from Judith Hudson, who says, recently Laura Tingle gave figures to illustrate that it's a myth the LMP are better financial managers um, and her question is, how can we help voters to realise this? But I guess my question for you, I'll start with you, Catherine, is do voters realise this? We're kind of seeing that, aren't we, in the, in the polling results, I guess. Well, yeah, there is this interesting reversal in the, in the polling results, and there's, there's, a, there's sort of three different markers that we've had over the last few months uh, one, a sort of broad, uh, broadly, you know, neutrally worded question on economic management, which Labor was ahead of the government on. Uh, another one on the China relationship that Pete referenced earlier. Then we've sort of got Labor ahead of their opponents on the most salient issue, economic management issue of the moment, which is cost of living, right? So there's, that is, it's quite interesting. Poll, like that is not normally the case in polls. So anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that all pans out. I'm not sure what figures Laura used in order to make the point, but uh, you know, there's a very simple comparison that can be made. Obviously, during the global financial crisis, the Labor government did avoid a recession. Uh, that uh, you know, we, we did have a technical recession in Australia in the opening stanzas of the pandemic, but I mean, I wouldn't be lining up to blast the government for that. I think in a fiscal sense, the government moved heaven and earth to try and avoid that. And in fact, I think there's some merit to their case that the economy is sort of coming out of the transition without labour market scarring because of that, right? I mean, there's other scarring and, and, and anyway, that's a whole other point that I won't unlock because we'd still be here in three hours. Anyway, um, I do think it's interesting that uh, at the moment that the Prime Minister feels compelled, he's certainly done it the last couple of days and he certainly did it this morning to sort of foreground this idea that the global financial crisis, uh, which Labor, a Labor government managed obviously domestically, was nothing compared to the crisis that he has managed, i.e. the pandemic and the, the sort of global economic and, and other ramifications of it. Um, it's sort of like my crisis is bigger than their crisis is, is really quite an interesting sort of turn in the public conversation. And I've been curious about this for the last few days because it's sort of an odd thing to say. Now, I mean, obviously one can measure the respective crises and I understand what the Prime Minister is talking about because obviously a pandemic has more complexity than a global financial meltdown caused by inept banking regulations in the United States and other countries, right? Obviously, a pandemic's got more dimensions to it, but I'm quite interested in my crisis is bigger than your crisis because it's suggestive to me that some of the arguments that the, that the coalition would often advance in this, in this message frame in economic management, 
perhaps are not doing the heavy lifting they have done for them in the past. So again, Morrison's trying to reframe to say, well, you know, uh, look, that, that was really big what I did. It was huge. And, and you know, why, don't, why can't you say thank you? I mean, obviously he's not saying that in those overt terms, but it's sort of a, it's sort of a plea really to, to, you know, to voters, please reward me for that stuff I did. And sort of just last point, looping back to the global financial crisis, that is, of course, the lesson Labor learned. No one thanks you for doing your job. And the Prime Minister is, is sort of reliving that 10 years after the fact with a different crisis. It's much more important than large crisis, he tells us, but he is you can see him. He's now learning the lesson that Labor learnt at the end of the GFC, which is no one thanks you for doing your job. Pete, did you have anything to add to that just in terms of, you know, how voters have that perception? Yeah, and people that have listened to me previously will know about my favourite theory of polling, the finger hut effect, which is named after Vic Fingerhut, a Washington pollster that's been doing the game since the 60s and has this really interesting insight. Right of centre parties, whether they're good, bad or indifferent at managing the economy, tend to be seen as better economic managers. And it's only when you put something that relates to individuals into your life that left of party centres get into the economic argument. So in 2007, it was work rights, which was the economic frame that delivered power for Rudd living like kitchen table living expenses is getting the high economic debates about debt and interest rates and inflation down to tin tax around the table and that's why i think labor's in the game um to catherine's point i i agree that you don't get a a reward for um something bad not happening but I also think the other piece is that you've got to give Labor credit in that first year of the pandemic they did you could only imagine how the coalition would have played that pandemic if Labor was in power and how they would have run interference they would have created that they would there would not have been that unity in, in reality what Morrison is most remembered for are the job seeker and job keeper which Labor basically forced him to take up, which has actually been the legacy that he's now running on. But unfortunately for him, a lot of other things have happened, including the second year of the pandemic and the failures of service delivery and the two climate catastrophes that um, bookended his time in power. So it's just not, I, he just can't get away with saying mission accomplished, give me more. And again, Back to my earlier point, each time he says anything, it is him saying it, and that is taking the salience away from his argument as well. Um, Richard, the next question I've got here is for you. It's from Christy Breakspear. She says, how much credibility can we attach to Morrison's boast that the Australian economy post-COVID is the best in the world? Uh, uh, hey, Christy. Um, thanks for your question. Look, best in the world. My crisis was bigger than yours. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately for the Prime Minister, uh, exaggeration is his go-to for everything. Um, look, the Australian labour market's doing pretty well at the moment with low unemployment. Uh, underemployment is, is relatively low by historic standards. It's no doubt the labour market's pretty tight, but the idea that our economy overall is doing really well at the moment, well, it, it's laughable. But this is my point about what what part of the economy are they currently trying to fix? What is their goal? We have the lowest productivity growth on record. So that means kind of going forward, we're gonna have lower wage growth than you'd ever expect. And guess what? We've already had the lowest wage growth on record and there's nothing in the budget that's going to help that. So in terms of uh, people's incomes, uh, in the short term wages growth, in the medium term productivity growth, both really low. Uh, inflation at the moment, cost of living, big concern, also rising rapidly. So that's going to be bad for people's standard of living. And to the extent that there was a sort of fiscal strategy, this government's just pumped money into an economy with inflation. So, you know, if you're talking about managing the economy, uh, you know, you would expect what they're doing to be actually pushing inflation up. They'll deny that between now and the election, you know, but that's that's what the budget papers say. That's what people at the RBA are thinking at the moment. So uh, an economy is a, is a, is a complicated, multifaceted beast. There's lots of parts to it. 
Morrison's latched on to one part, and that is low unemployment rate, and says, look, my economy is the best in the world. Uh, but A, that's not true in any meaningful sense. And B, I think this is kind of a bigger problem for him. Uh, no one feels that and no one thinks it's true. So as Catherine said, kind of telling everyone my crisis is better than yours, you know, just makes people think that, you know, you're, you're losing it. And him going out there saying our economy is the best in the world, he runs that risk of you've never had it so good, you know, that sort of trap that Paul Keating fell into. And then just finally, you know, kind of can't not say it at this time, but, you know, the climate has changed we're not talking about climate change as an abstract phenomena. People are experiencing, experiencing, not reading about, seeing the biggest fires, the biggest floods, rainfall, even if you didn't get flood, no one that lives in Sydney thinks the climate isn't different from anything they've ever experienced. And I do think that that uh, is, is just fundamentally changing the way that people are looking at these issues. But they might not think that climate change is the number one voting issue, but this thing, is it real, isn't it real, that's gone. No one thinks that Scott Morrison's the guy that's going to look after you in this new climate, So, which, which is, of course, a giant part of the economy. You know, go ask the people of Lismore, you know, how their economy is doing at the moment. It's been ruined by a changed climate. So, uh, yeah, no, best in the world, no, meaningless. But even saying it, I think, is dangerous for Scott Morrison. He feels obliged to say it because he's so pleased with himself. But I don't think saying it wins him a vote. Catherine, uh, Richard's just kind of talked there about climate change, which brings me to the next question from Kate Cooper. She's quoted um, the Antonio Guterres saying, climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, but the truly dangerous radicals are the country's increasing production of fossil fuels and investing in new fossil fuels infrastructure. Um, might that describe Australia? <laughs> well, there is, there is this, this strange contradiction that regular um, viewers of the show will be fully aware of, given how often we talk about it, um, about that old net zero commitment uh, without uh, any sort of actual tangible strategy to get there, including the constraint of fossil fuels, which is part of the equation. It, you know, I think uh, you don't get to net zero just by offsetting all your emissions and certainly not by exporting emissions to the rest of the world on the scale that Australia does at the present time. So, um, look, it's, uh, yeah, but it, it's sort of obviously... Uh, I, I just think we need, I, I agree with Richard that I, I don't think the country, um, even in the parts of the country that have voted against climate action over the last, uh, at every election since 2013, uh, I don't, I agree. I don't think there is now a live sort of ridiculous debate about whether or not climate science should be believed or not. I think the country has moved past that for the reasons Richard articulates, which is that this is now a lived reality, not a forecast or, uh, you know, some sort of Nostradamus type prediction. Uh, we are we are living in a changed climate, uh, and heating is is a is a present experience rather than a forecast. But again, um, I'm not necessarily saying that climate is the issue that 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 will be weaponized again as it was very successfully in 2019. Uh, but there's, you know, there's a tone in the show today that we're sort of, um, you know, we, we've already consigned the government to history in terms of this election contest. Uh, I, again, uh, look, I, I can read the polls, including ours. Um, I, there, I know uh, that Labor is currently ahead in the polls. I, I know from recent field visits uh, that uh, people are really jack of the Prime Minister. Uh, but again, elections in Australia are hard fought. They're generally close. In the event that we are in a quote unquote normal election, I, I'm sorry, I've been pessimistic on this show now for a, a number of months about, about th this, this outlook because I know we're speaking to a progressive audience. Uh, it's, you know, I don't, I don't think this election is in the bag I, for progressive voters. I don't. I don't uh, think that that it's all that it's all done uh, and uh, that people are now so Jack and Morrison that they can't possibly 
re-elect them. I think there is a campaign there that one side will win and one side will lose. And that's what we're looking at over the next sort of eight weeks or so. Yeah, um, Richard, I want to come to you just sticking with climate change for a bit um, because Catherine mentioned Australia's exports there and I feel like a lot of our climate debate around policy is often, I mean, um, usefully directed at what's happening domestically with the transition and, and those kinds of things. But as Catherine mentioned, we've got huge exports as well um, that don't really get uh, a huge amount of scrutiny. Could you just lay out for us um, in terms of Australia's exports of fossil fuels, kind of the scope of the problem that we're not dealing with? Oh, absolutely. So step one, Australia is the, large, the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. We're behind two little countries people have probably heard of, Saudi Arabia and Russia. We are the third biggest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. But we're not, you know, we're not resting on our laurels. We are determined to increase our exports of fossil fuels. Uh, and, and the budget papers sort of make this crystal clear. So not only are we the third largest in the world, we are planning for a big expansion. And we often hear, you know, the talk about the domestic transition towards renewables or the domestic transition away from fossil fuels. That's all great. As our 60 year old steam engine coal fired power stations fall to pieces, you bet they're being replaced with renewables and that's good. But that's not policy that's driving that at the moment, it's old age. But when it comes to things that we can control, we are transitioning towards fossil fuels. So I like to go back to Paris 2015. And in 2015, Australia didn't mine coal in North Queensland, right? Now we do. We've got the Adani coal mine up there exporting coal with plans to open new coal mines in the Galilee Basin. So we're transitioning new parts of the country into coal. We are now, since 2015, we've become the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas, overtaking Qatar. We didn't export any LNG from the east coast of Australia in 2015. Now we're the world's largest exporter, yay us. But we're not resting on our laurels. Again, you know, we've got the enormous Betaloo Basin in Queensland. Uh, we've got gas developments in northwest Australia. And, and of course, all of this mining of coal and extracting of gas, not only will that increase the world's emissions when they burn it, that doesn't count on our account, but the mere act of extracting it is driving Australia's emissions through the roof, where our emissions are rising from those sectors. But, you know, we're using dodgy offsets to sort of say, oh, if you look at the land sector and blah, 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 the fact is our fossil fuel emissions are rising, not falling. And we are spending $11 billion a year subsidising the expansion of fossil fuels. So it's great that there's more renewables in Australia. Thumbs up, yay us. But we are the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. We are, we are betting that the rest of the world is not taking their climate commitment seriously. And we're particularly keen to work with the Southeast Asian countries to say, why don't you buy our gas? We'll sell you some coal. So Europe and the US are transitioning fast, but we're flooding into domestic countries. Uh, and our FOIs have sort of made this clear. When the Australian Prime Minister goes overseas, we're lobbying Bangladesh, Vietnam, all these countries to, to commit to coal and gas so we can sell it to them. Uh, Catherine, um, I'm not sure if we've got a response to that, but I was just going to point out the Australian Institute recently released a report on um, the total subsidies, uh, public subsidies for the fossil fuel industry across state and federal governments, which is up uh, more than a billion dollars from last year. It's more than $11 billion in the last year uh, for that. Um, but Catherine, you look like you were gonna say yeah. something. No, no, I was just, uh, Richard talking about that, put it in my mind, uh, just about the expansion of uh, the fossil fuel sector and in current events, just worth bookmarking again uh, with folks today. 
Um, a couple of points. Obviously, we did see a foray uh, by the Energy Minister, Angus Taylor, a public foray into um, uh, saying to the European Union at one point, boy, you guys, uh, I bet you, you wish you'd pursued a gas-fired recovery after after the um, after the pandemic, as we have done in Australia, you know, uh, now you're reliant on Putin's gas, right? We did see Angus Taylor come out and make a bit of a show of this. Then that point was never seen or heard of again. <laughs> it was so I threw a blanket over that real, real quick. Uh, the other thing too that, that is of interest, just to um, you know, uh, Richard and and my analysis around these questions, and my and me saying to progressive lovely progressive people listening <laughs> bear in mind <laughs> the campaign hasn't been won um i think it is interesting that uh around the whole sort of pitch of the budget if you uh if you look at um how the budget was sold uh, including the element of uh, barnaby joyce's uh rather large infrastructure package uh, that he extracted in order to support net zero all of that gas-fired recovery language, in fact, was on the down low so massively, it was not even cited anywhere. There was, you know, in the Treasurer's speech, I don't think there was one reference to gas, for example, in anything that he said. And again, I thought that was interesting, just on the mm. point, Richard's fundamental point about the climate change argument is more or less settled in the country that I don't dispute. Uh, I think that's a marker of it, in fact, that... Uh, you know, at one point, Joyce would have marketed his own package on the national stage as being, you know, a big win for the fossil fuels industry because a lot of it is back-end infrastructure to support fossil fuels in, in parts of the country. But not even he's been selling it that way. He's been talking about dams and agriculture and other things, which, which is quite interesting. If, for those of us who have, you know, hit our heads on the table about climate climate and how climate policy has been weaponized in Australian election campaigns for more than a decade. I think there, there's a lot of evidence around in the public space at the moment that, that, that the country has, has moved on uh, from those fundamental questions. Anyway, that was all I was going to say. Uh, well, it wouldn't be a pole position if we didn't spend a chunk of it on climate change, I feel like. So uh, thanks for the great question and for those responses, Catherine and Richard. Um, We've got, I can see uh, almost 900 people on the line with us. Um, uh, so thank you for joining us today. Um, Catherine, I've got just one question here from Paul Cox, who asked about the recent political appointments to the AAT, uh, apparently a huge number appointed yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Appointment palooza. Yes, uh, there is there is no surer sign uh, of the fact that the campaign or the, the start of the official campaign is now only days away than the absolute torrent of appointments that uh, rushes out of the government in its last weeks. We actually at Guardian Australia did an analysis of the number of appointments um, prior to the 2019 election which uh, if you search for the reporter uh, Christopher Norse and appointments, you'll probably still be able to search on Guardian Australia for that story. We actually quantified the number and let's just cut, you know, spoiler alert, gobsmacking uh, amount of appointments of people with political connections. What's happened uh, yesterday? Yes, there was, there were a bunch of new appointees to the uh, AAT uh, including people uh, with, with coalition uh, backgrounds, either as protagonists or staffers. Uh, also uh, a former parliamentarian, John McVeigh, I think now people will correct me if I'm wrong, was appointed to the Murray-Darling Basin uh, Authority as well. Also just in the context of the uh, discussion we just had then about gas and gas exports, a, a gas lobbyist, Andrew McConville, who currently heads up uh, the, the Gas Industry Association in Canberra was also appointed, I think, to the Murray-Darling uh, Basin Commission, so it, it, into a water role, which is obviously interesting given the crossover between gas extraction and water issues. So, yeah, look, it's just uh, basically, you know, the government is uh, using its remaining time in order to uh, get through appointments that it wants to get through who make sure bodies are reappointed either, you know, uh, as, as part of, you know, just <laughs> what politicians do 
um, uh, but also I think to um, determine the sort of future direction of these bodies in the event that there's a change of government. It's sort of twofold. It's kind of like, uh, you know, appointing people who, um, you know, uh, are rewarded with, with these opportunities, but also influencing the direction of the country over the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure about, uh, as you were saying, that appointment of the, the gas executive to the Murray-Darling Basin Commission, given water is such precious resource. And uh... Well, it's an interesting appointment. And obviously, I've got nothing against Andrew McConville, who appears to be a thoroughly competent person. Um, but uh, I suspect there'll be a bit of a backlash to that. Um, uh, because you point out, it's like, actually, it's in conflict in a lot of areas, like, a lot of people um, contemplating putting gas wells on their uh, property, for example, the water table and the impact on water is kind of the number one reason why people freak out about it. So, yeah. 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 Very yeah. interesting to watch. Um, I'm afraid we might have to wrap it up there. Thank you very much, everyone, for your fantastic questions. As always, I'm afraid that we couldn't get to all of them, um, but we did have, as I said, close to 900 people on the line with us today. So there's some fantastic questions in there and hopefully we've covered um, a fair amount of ground. Thank you to Pete, Catherine and Richard for all of your help today. And also thank you to Sienna Parrott for moderating and Sumitri Venkata Subramanian for live tweeting this event. We really appreciate it. Thank you all of you for coming along. Uh, we'll be back a fortnight from now. Uh, probably the election will be called in the meantime. Uh, but don't forget to check out Guardian Australia for the analysis of the Central Poll today, uh, theessentialreport.com.au for all those latest results from the polling. Uh, this audio will be available as a podcast on Guardian Australia from tomorrow morning. And of course, the recording will go up on australiainstitute.tv. Thanks so much for joining us today. Take care out there. Make sure you are registered to vote. I moved in the last 12 months, not to hear this is my dad's place, but um, I was reminded very recently that I hadn't updated my registration. So now is a good time to remember to do that at the AEC. Uh, perhaps you've moved and forgotten to update your enrollment and uh, we are headed to an election. So everyone should be involved and make sure you're updated and enrolled to vote. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We'll see you again very soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, guys. Bye. Yeah.